discrimination and disparities. Let's get, let's get the, the underlying argument of the book uh, established here. The, I'm quoting you again, Tom. The fact that economic and other outcomes often differ greatly among individuals, groups, institutions, and nations poses questions to which many people give very different answers. At one end of the spectrum, the belief that those who have been less fortunate are genetically less capable. That's the racist argument, essentially. All right. At the other end, the belief that those less fortunate are victims of other people. And that's the argument, let's be, to, for me to put it crudely, that's the argument that liberals or progressives tend to make. Yes. Okay. Although I will say progressives were in the forefront of those putting the genetic argument 100 years ago. Oh, so explain that. For example, uh, Woodrow Wilson was a leader of the progressive movement. Yes. And one of the leading racists of, yes. the, of the day. Oh, see, and, and many people look back and say, well, his racism was just an exception to his liberalism. No, that was the what progressives were pushing that whole time. And not, and not, and, uh, not, not so much against blacks because they, they just assumed that blacks couldn't do anything. Uh, but they were pushing it against uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. And it was they who pushed the ideas that led to the great immigration restrictions of the 1920s. All right. Again, discrimination and disparities. Disparities can reflect the plain fact that success in many kinds of endeavors depends on prerequisites peculiar to each endeavor, and a relatively small difference in meeting those prerequisites can mean a very large difference in outcomes, close quote. Now, you illustrate that point by describing a sociological or psychological experiment that Professor Terman here at Stanford conducted at the beginning of the 20th century or so. Well, it wasn't so much experiment, it was, it was an empirical study. He, he picked uh, something like 1,500 people uh, who had IQs in the top 1%, and he followed them, or his program did, for a period of more than 50 years to see how they turned out. And so, uh, and what, what I point out in the, in the book is that uh, the disparity is within that narrow range. Uh, the, 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 the top third, for example, had more than 10 times as many postgraduate degrees as the bottom third among people who were all in the top 1%. So there were obviously many other things that had to come together. Right. The other thing was that two people who failed to make the 140 IQ cutoff ended up getting Nobel Prizes in physics, as nobody among these 1,500 ever did. So obviously there have to be a lot of things come together. And you write, again, I'm quoting you here, Tom, the biggest differentiating factor in that study was family background. Yes. And explain that. Well, the, the ones who were in that top third, they came from families that were more, more educated. The ones who were in that bottom third, something like almost 30% or so uh, had a parent who had dropped out of school before the eighth grade. So it doesn't matter how much brain power you may have uh, you know, if you're not ra raising a home where people are thinking, where they're doing intellectual things, you, you're not in the same position as someone with the same IQ who, who's, who's in a family right. that has that, uh, that kind of background. So the, so the point is you've got these 1,500 brilliant kids. You mm -hmm. follow them for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And if, if nobody knew anything else about them, they'd say, gee, some of these people are relatively poor and some of these people are relatively unfortunate by mm -hmm. comparison with the others. And Tom Sowell says, well, the genetic argument is ruled out of bounds immediately because they're all brilliant. Mm -hmm. They're all in the top 1% by, in terms of smarts. Yeah. But so is the argument that anybody victimized them. Mm -hmm. The principal factor that accounted for success as opposed to failure or ending up was family background. And that's really not victimization. That's a question of almost cosmic luck. Absolutely. What kind of family? Is it, that's right? Is that yes. right? Okay. This is why I spend so much time on the difference between the firstborn child and the others. Oh, explain that. Well, that uh, I first became aware of this years ago when I got, came across some data on you know, the finalists for the National Merit Scholarship. And in five child families, that finalist was the, fifth, the firstborn more often than the other four put together. And in four child families, that firstborn was the finalist more often than the other three, and two child, wherever you do it. Uh, and the only, the only, uh, the only uh, child who does better than the firstborn is the only child. And, and then the other thing is that twins tend to have several points lower average IQ than people who are born one at a time. And so when you put all that together, it suggests that uh, the amount of parental attention a child gets makes a huge difference in the future. I see. 
But again, you can't, you, 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 you the argument that. of victimization doesn't really apply there. That's more. Nor does ge genetics. Right. They're, they're born to the same parents and raised under the same roof. Right. All right.